So I welcome you all and we are, I think this is going to be the last uh, lecture meeting for this course. And the last couple of topics are now left. And one of them is, um, is about the corporate taxes and the impact of financing on real asset valuation. And I, I would say that the, this, this section of the discussion is heavily based on the text by uh, they mentioned here, and that book is available. Um, the starting point of this discussion is that uh, debt interest payments are tax deductible. Okay. Um, so if you look at some financial statement of a company, you will find that the interest tax, the, the interest payments that you make are tax deductible. Um, I think I've shown you a few times, have I? That you calculate interest before you pay tax. Or do you want to see the evidence? If you want, I can show you some financial statements and show it. Or do you know it? Or are you convinced? Okay, in that case, I, I will quickly show it. I'm, I know some of you have seen it before, but I can quickly show. Uh, so I would show you, for, for instance, the financial statement of, let's say, uh, Finnish company, Kone. Yeah. And let's see how, what they do about it. So then for the rest of the calculation, we will keep uh, Kone as a, actually, I think that I should give you the example of Marks and Spencer. You know why? Because in Optima, there is a spreadsheet, you know, the, the folder. And over there, I have done the same example uh, with the help of Marks and Spencer. So that will keep you the same consistent example. Hmm? Make sense? So I will show you the financial statements of Marks and Spencer. So... So here you can see the uh, financial statement of Marks and Spencer, and I only picked up a consolidated income statement of this firm. And you can see here, because the thing I want to say that the interest payments are tax deductible, yeah? Now here you see that the finance cost. Can you see finance cost here? Yeah? Uh, finance cost is uh, basically the interest cost. And you can see here 111.6, one, one I guess they are million um, pounds, okay? Uh, this is the amount which company is paying towards interest because they are using the expression parentheses for the cash outflow. So the money outflow, the, the expense. So it's 111.6 one, one, one million uh, interest payments they're giving each year, uh, this year. And here, what happened is that, uh, after minusing, deducting this finance cost, you calculate profit before tax, PBT, which is called gross profit, or which is also called earnings before tax in some you know, uh, books. And then you pay tax here, income tax expense, or we more appropriate word is corporate tax. And then there is profit for the year, or profit after tax, PAT, or earnings after tax, EAT, e uh, but the, the beauty is that the tax is only calculated before you have paid. So you calculate tax after you pay the interest. So after interest is paid, then tax is calculated. So may I say that interest has borne no cost of tax. Can I say that interest is tax deductible? Can I say that the state, the Ministry of Revenue or Taxation, or the in, in, in case of Britain, it's a, um, HM, I think it's a, Her, Her Majesty uh, of Revenue and Taxation Department have done a great favor to those people who lend to the company because what they are paid back is tax deductible. So on debt, there's no tax. Which tax? Corporate tax, right? So I can say that basically the interest payments are given 
not only they it's like a subsidy you know they get subsidy there's no tax burden on them having a no tax burden is equal to a subsidy but here you see it down this is the dividend this is the profit and then uh, this is the money which goes to the shareholders of the company it means that what shareholders get from the company is after corporate tax deduction so the x the weight the burden the sword of tax which tax again be precise corporate tax is falling on the out of two type of investors investors are debt holders and shareholders the corporate tax is only falling on the shareholders whereas the debt holders are getting this tax exemption so that is why that is that is what my claim was that interest is tax deductible okay so whichever company you find you will see that the interest payment is always calculated before the company pays the uh, corporate tax and then after whatever is left over uh, as a matter of fact profit is also called residual claim so the shareholders always have the they are called residual claimants which means that they only claim whatever is left out left over it could be possible that your net profit is zero or negative but who cares uh, the the people who lend the company they have been paid already so in the packing order it means that the out of two types of investors debt holders are treated uh, as a privilege uh, as a privilege investors by the tax man which which in terms of which tax corporate tax be precise that it is only to the extent of corporate tax but we will see about what happens to the personal income tax but as the discussion continues but that that was my main point that mm, uh yeah that debt interest payments are tax deductible and i wrote here a point that you uh, it's a good idea it's not a bad idea to observe some financial statement we have seen now in case of marks and spencer uh, you may argue that the debt financing is cheaper that way because it doesn't bear any tax burden remember tax is a cost and there's no tax cost it means debt can be cheaper all right uh, the question is that should we go for infinite tax uh, infinite debt then should we go beyond uh, and we should replace the equity with debt because debt is so handsome the tax the debt is so uh, alluring because it gives you the tax advantage the answer is definitely no definitely no because even though there is a tax advantage attached to the debt uh, there is a cost and the cost is the financial distress cost the financial distress cost um, is about that when you borrow there is more performance pressure on you but when you raise more equity there is no such pressure do you, do you see the treatment because the company by definition uh, is not only uh, not obliged to pay dividend to the shareholders but the company is not obliged to pay their even basic investment on the contrary there is more obligation on debt you not only pay you not only repay the debt but you also give them the interest the company may choose not to pay dividends for many years but the company has to pay interest on debt okay and that brings added pressure on the company and as a result uh, as a result uh, the company could run into some kind of crisis you know and that is called financial distress cost financial distress cost here i mean that when the company is borrow beyond its means beyond its safe limits then there is a danger of potential bankruptcy and that is called financial distress cost okay so guess what when you borrow unlimitedly 
you not only have to return the amount to the to the extent of last penny but you also pay interest and not only you have to pay it but you have to pay it in a time timely manner in time you can't postpone your interest payments to next year okay and if you raise equity when a company is already neck deep in debt then the premium which you pay to investors to the shareholder is huge it means that uh, when you try to get equity when you are very much in debt uh, you pay more capm will calculate higher return on minimum return you pay on equity okay so you will be that be double whammy so you are caught between uh, between the between the you know two sides like a uh, the fire and the fire pan both are burning <laughs> so you make a choice so that would be very unpleasant situation for the company okay uh, so can we determine a judicious mix of debt and equity yes we can it's very challenging and if you are a corporate finance manager of a company you struggle with this idea day in day out okay um so this is some background about the capital uh let me see if i'm sharing the right file Now for this slide I want you to have a feel of uh, a financial statement called balance sheet of the company how many of you have seen uh, a balance sheet in your life all of you have seen right and if i can actually show you with the same marks and spencers file uh, otherwise uh okay so i'm showing you the balance sheet of uh, marks and spencer you can see here there are assets total assets and their total liabilities here hmm? and the sum of total assets and total liabilities must be same yeah that's the basic premise of our discussion people the scholars say that all the value that a company generates or creates come from the asset side because asset side is the investing side investing side mean you buy assets you invest you big you build up infrastructure you are creating something so a company's value is only created by the asset side and then the next question is that what is the job of the liability side and the answer is that liability side is only the financing side so asset side is the investing liability is financing so if i have to draw a picture very quickly some of you might have seen it some of you haven't but there's no harm in seeing it again because in this uh, topic this this uh, role of uh, the role of this balance sheet and asset assets is very important uh, the philosophy is that the idea is that this is a company yeah this is a firm the firm has three pillars the first pillar is financing and then this and th this financing uh, if i can say in uh, in a phrase i can say where money comes from where money comes from <coughs> okay so this is the financing and i can also call it 
part of the liability side because after all when you get your company funded financed this is your liability be it debt holder or equity holder it's a company's liability because company company the shares how to say it uh, the, the the company is not same as the shareholders right it has a separate legal entity all right so even though this is the company's shareholder equity even then it's a liability because company owes to somebody so this is basically a representation of liability side here and in this financing you get some money you get from debt and the other you get from equity okay uh, and the ratio of debt to equity the proportion the division between debt and equity is called your capital structure capital structure so this uh, ratio proportion between b and e uh, is your capital structure and that's why if you uh, if you see the article which i showed you i use the phrase capital structure mm -hmm. and if your d is increasing for a given e let's say the company was 100 euros value debt used to be 40 and equity used to be 60 but let's say things change you make it 60 40 so i can say that company has become more leveraged when the proportion of debt increases for a given level of equity you can see that the company has become more leveraged leveraged or levered leveraged okay so it's very important that these concepts you understand um, did i speak too fast yeah so this is the, the this rela relationship between debt to equity is called capital structure and capital structure could be over leveraged excessively leveraged when you have uh, imagine you used to have 40 euros of debt and 60 percent of equity let's say 40 percent 60 percent and now it becomes 60 40 it means for the given amount of equity the ratio of the share of debt has increased so i have no hesitation to say that the company has become over leveraged too leveraged and then this side of the story is that we have investing side investing investing side if i put in quotes i would say where money goes to where money goes to well money goes to buy your assets when you get the money what what would you do with the as a company what would you do well you will invest where in projects in assets physical assets r and d intangibles uh, your human resources whatever you can which can help you to create the value so then it's called assets okay what is in the middle the company's operations you got the money you invested is that end of the story no now you have to use those assets nine to five sometime nine to nine in three shifts 24 7 sometimes that comes that that uh, pinpoints your operations how well you operate how well you are making use of your capacities and let's say your total cost of capital is five percent whereas the return on assets is seven percent so it means that what you gain is more than what you pay well you have a net positive so that is an indicator of that your operations are successful on the contrary if your total return on capital cost of capital uh, is 10 percent whereas you are generating your return on assets six percent seven percent it means you're making a loss so when you compare it's like a cost and the benefit 
The benefit should be more than the cost for the company to become uh, financially successful and feasible. Otherwise, these losses will not be sustainable. So that is the whole idea. Now, this, this is the main story, but I want to come on this picture. After you understand this picture, I would say that the classical economist, they would say that this is only a package. Financing does not add to the value. You have more debt, less equity, uh, more equity, less debt. It's immaterial. What matters is this side, the investing side. The assets are the one who are the value creators. So if you have to find the drivers of the company's value, uh, you will say the assets. Whereas liability or the financing side is just uh, some kind of uh, support system, periphery, ancillary, auxiliary, just uh, something which is supporting you. But the main, the main, you know, the the uh, the mover and shaker is the is the the asset side, the investing side. Okay, this is a very old-fashioned classical view about capital structure. And then we have uh, uh, two two scholars. Uh, it's a very famous uh, proposition, Modigliani and Miller's proposition. I don't know if you have heard it before. Uh, very famous economist, uh, Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller. Uh, they are of this opinion that a firm cannot change its value just by splitting its cash flow into two streams. So they say that basically the company's value is created by real assets which are on the investing side and the company cannot create the value from the liability side so they say that this this side is only a support system I, they don't say that this is just junk no it's fine but don't pin very high hopes on this side because if the value is to be created it has to be on this side investing side we will we will try to prove them wrong today yeah uh, they have an idea uh, that in perfect financial markets, the market value of the firm is unaffected by its financial structure or the capital structure is irrelevant. So their idea is that there is a firm one, okay? Uh, in the firm one, and let's assume that this company has no debt the company which has no debt is called unleveraged or unlevered company. Yeah? I think we discussed when we discussed last week, levered beta and unlevered beta, right? Uh, imagine you are a shareholder of this company which has zero debt. And let's say you own 1% of the company. It means that your investment is 1% in the entire company and Based on this 1% investment, your claim in the profit will also be 1%. Very fair, very just. Then we have a second company. It was it quick? So I, I repeat, uh, imagine you are an investor who is going to invest in a company with zero debt. Hence, the company is unlevered. Because you invest 1%, so you own 1% of this. Can you see this word VU? It means value of unlevered company. You own 1% of the value of unlevered company. Hence, you claim 1% of the profits of this company as well. Hmm? And then you go to the next slide here you own you you spend the same amount of money as you invested in the u company but this time the company's title changes and it become levered so i call it vl value of levered company and let's imagine that this time you invest the company's value still remain 100 
percent, and you invest one percent in debt and one percent in equity. Okay, so as against unlevered company, you choose to invest in a levered company. So what happens? You own one percent of the debt and one percent of the equity. And in this case, company's total value would be value of debt plus value of equity. So you own 1% of this debt, 1% of equity, and then you also claim 1% of the interest and 1% of the profits. Okay, profits minus interest. Now, if you add both sides, this side and this side, remember you own 1% of what? 1% of profits minus interest because you're not going to take all the profit. See, in this picture, you straight away take 1% of the entire profit because there's no debt, there's no interest payment. But now, in this case, you have company who has debt also. So you definitely get 1% of interest, but before you get the profits, 1% of the profit as a shareholder, your interest payments should be subtracted, which means you can only claim 1% of profits minus interest. Now, if you add this side and this side vertically, what you get here is 0 0.01 is common and in the bracket comes DL plus EL, debt of levered company and equity of levered company. And as, as I said before, debt plus equity is a total value of the company. So basically you are owning 1% of the company. And here, if you add vertically, interest is plus, here interest is minus, what you left is 1% of profits. And this is exactly the same output, the outcome which we had before. Here, you are investing 1%, you own 1% of the company, and you, you claimed 1% of the profits. Here again, uh, this time company is not unlevered. This time company is unlevered, but you still own, you still own 1% uh, of the company and you claim 1% of the profits. Nothing has changed. It means either you invest in an unlevered company or uh, an, a levered company, Ceteris Paribus, all things being equal, uh, you are neither better off nor worse off. Hence, debt or equity, this debate is not relevant. That's the idea. And who gave this idea? Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller. And these, these are still uh, one of the most famous theories in the world. Um, they got Nobel Prize in economics, both of them. It was a joint work. Uh, they have been highly criticized then after even before, but still um, in, the, in, the, in the colleges and the universities, their theory is a starting point. See what, just because a theory is proved wrong doesn't make it irrelevant because that gives, that serves as a benchmark. The failure is a benchmark for the further development. So even though this theory finds no place in the reality in the modern day world, because, and I, I would prove it wrong with a very, childish example in, in few slides to follow. But the idea is that it's a food for thought. Even though it's less relevant or irrelevant nowadays, but still it gives us some, to, to do some basic benchmarking of our thoughts. Okay. So that is why when we meet some successful people and learn from them, it's also important to meet some unsuc unsuccessful people and and learn from them as well. All right, so um, without going too much into the discussion, I want to give you an example. I think the order of slides is a little bit strange, but I want to give you an example. Actually, it's not strange, it's right, but I think I will, I will come back to this example again in a different context, but at the moment I want to prove Modigliani and Miller wrong. Yeah, uh, that's why I'll come back to this example again in a different context, but I want, I want to discuss it now. We have two companies, 
VL and VU. The VL is a company which is a levered company, yeah? And VU is a company which is unlevered company. Look, up to EBIT, they both are same. Up to EBIT, they both are same. You know what? I kept them equal on purpose. Because EBIT, the earnings before interest and tax shows your operational performance. So imagine both companies have same operational performance. Then where is the difference? The difference is when we study their financing side. See what happens. Since this company has no debt, which one? U. Remember, U is without debt, which means unlevered company. And L is with debt, which means the levered company. And imagine that the company which is levered has got, has, has borrowed $1,000 at 8% rate of interest. I wrote it here. But for the unlevered company, this figure would be zero because there is no debt, no interest. Yeah. For the levered company, this would be 80. 80. 8% of 1,000, the pre-tax income, which pre-tax income, you can call it gross, gross profit or profit before tax. 1,000 minus zero is 1,000. 1,000 minus 80 is 920. Yeah. 34% is rate of tax. 1,000, 34%, 340. Profit after tax. Net profit is 660, yeah? 34% of 920 is 312.80. Profit after tax is 607.20. The value of the company is the sum total of the streams which goes to both types of investors. So if I find the value of the company that has been generated, I find that the total income stream given to investors here is 660. What do you mean by investors? Investors are shareholders and debt holders, right? Do you agree? Investors are shareholders plus debt holders. In this company, there's no debt holder. Hence, this value is zero. But 660 belongs to the shareholders. And if you want to see in Marks and Spencer's case, I can show you here. Uh, you can go back to the sorry. So if you want to find how much income stream Marks and Spencer has produced, look, this is a bit. First of all, let me check if the slide is, yeah, it's fine. This is a bit, yeah. This is the income stream which goes to debt holders. And this is the income stream which goes to the shareholders. All right, so 417 something a million which goes to the shareholders and 111.6 one, one, one goes to the debt holders. So you can add them to find how much income stream goes to. The so same way here, you can see that since this company has no debt, you company, yeah? So, They get zero debt, zero interest income, and 660, the net profit. So all together, 660. But if you look at this company, this side, the levered company, the levered company is paying $80 as a interest, and 607.20 belongs to the shareholders. And if you add them up, it comes to be 687.20, which is $27.20 more than what you would have given if the company was no debt company. And this 27.20 is not generated from the operating profit. 
it's not generating from the asset side. It is generated from the liability side. So it means that if this company had zero debt, it would have given 660 to its investors. But because the company is not zero debt, but it has a debt, then the company is giving $27.20 more to its investors. Modi Galliani and Miller would say, no, it doesn't matter. They even say that, uh, they say that asset side is like, a, like the real present and the liability side is like a wrapping paper. And the wrapping paper can be very attractive, but it doesn't really make any sense if the gift is bad. But here, what happens? The value of 27.20, it could be million, it could be billion. This is generated by the liability side, which means financing side. This is a complete contradiction or absolute refutation of Modigliani and Miller theorem. Look, with just very basic numbers, we are able to refute them. But I still uh, keep this theory in very high esteem. And I will tell you more about it when you go further. Okay. Then one uh, subtopic, which is little bit, which is not directly related, but little bit related, is called homemade leverage. Um, the homemade leverage is that when you invest, you invest in a company's debt and equity, yeah? But where does your money come from? The money which you plan to invest in the company, where does it come from? Like for example, uh, if I'm an investor and I want to invest in a company, right? Where will my resources come from? So that's equity, yeah? But can I also borrow and invest in the company? Can I borrow from the bank and invest in the companies? So basically, as a micro investor, as a individual entity, I have my own debt to equity ratio, which I give to the company by investing. And then company itself, decides that, hey, you know what? I want to have more debt or more equity. So the capital structure is not just relevant to the companies, but also to the individuals who are investing. All right. The question is that when the company is making the changes in its D to E ratio, debt to equity ratio, you can't remain unaffected. It will also affect you. It can affect you favorably or unfavorably. But the point is that, can you make some corresponding changes? When a company makes changes in its capital structure, can you also make changes in your capital structure so that you are neither, if not better off, then definitely not worse off? That is called homemade leverage. Look at the word homemade. It's a symbol that this belongs to the capital structure or the leverage of a common investor. All right. I think this point would be very clear um, or more clear rather if I give you an example. Imagine the interest on debt is 5% and the EBIT for it, each company, you know, each company means levered or unlevered company is 50,000 and tax, don't worry about it. And the company is paying all the dividend. Whatever is the profit is given as dividend to the investors. Company is very generous. Uh, how it makes the impact. All right. If you invest in a unlevered company, yeah, your equity is 200,000. That's the value of the company's $200,000. No debt. Whereas in this case, if the company's name is L or the levered company, uh, let's assume that equity is 100,000 and debt is 100,000. 
So you have an option that you can invest in the levered company or unlevered company. Um, if you invest in the levered company, then you can invest in the company's equity and debt. Yeah, the ratio is one because D to E is 100,000 divided by 100,000. Here, the ratio of is zero because it's zero divided by 200,000. So that's why the ratio is zero and one. Zero is absolutely no debt. One is 50-50 uh, percentage of debt and equity. You want to make, you have $10,000 because you, you're a small investor. You have $10,000 to invest and the company is levered, okay? Levered means the company has debt and equity, both. So the company is this basically on the right-hand side, this levered company, so 100,000, 100,000. What you get, what you get is, the company's operating profit was 50,000, was it? The company's EBIT or the operating profit was 50,000. And you come to the company, hey, pay my profits. Shit, hey, wait, 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 wait. I'm not going to give you yet. Remember, first of all, I have to pay to the debt holders. Remember, the debt holders are standing before you in the queue. And the company knows that it has borrowed 100,000. You know where it comes from? Because company's debt is 100,000. And how much interest it pays? 5%. So the company says, hey, don't, don't rush, don't be uh, impatient. Uh, before I know my profit is 50,000, which is good, but I will not pay you yet. First, let me pay to the debt holders. The debt is 100,000, the interest is 5%. And the residual profit is the profit after interest is, uh, or the gross profit is 45,000. And we ignore in this case that we don't assume any tax. So that's, we live in a no tax era. Now, 45,000 is the profit which belongs to the shareholders. And we assume that there is no tax. And we also assume that all the profits are given to the shareholders. The dividend ratio is 100%. Out of 45,000, you get 10%. You know why? Because you invested how much? 10,000. 10,000 is 10% 10 of 100,000. And 100,000 was your equity. Remember, you only bought shares. You only bought shares. So for you, 200,000 makes no sense to you. It, you only invest in companies equity. You invested 100,000 equity. The total equity is 100. No, you invested $10,000 in the equity. The total equity is 100,000, which means you are owning 10% of companies equity shares. By the by the principle of fairness, you also claim 10% of the profit, which is 45%. This is your return on investment. How much? 45%. Okay. And this company is what? This company is levered company. This company is levered, yeah? But now what happens? Are, are you okay with the mathematics till, me, till here? Are you okay with the calculations or not? Because it's very important for you to understand now what I have done here. This is a pre-change situation. The change is now going to happen. And you will see that this will also affect you. The question is that how can you ensure yourself that this bad 
unfavorable change do not affect you. Faith, you have a question? You mean here? Okay, all right, we go again. The company is, initially the company is levered. Let's say this is the situation one. The company, can you see the cursor? No? Okay, that's strange. Imagine this company is a levered company. But the levered is that the 100,000 uh, 100, come from equity and 100,000 come from debt, yeah? So, so you are a shareholder. You're not a debt holder. You are a, you are a shareholder, but you invest in a company which has debt and equity, both. But you only invest in shares. The companies, and you invest how much? 10,000 in equity. So basically this 10,000 is 10% 10 of the company's equity. So it means you own the company by 10% of its shares. Uh, the company's operating profit is uh, 50,000, which are here. But the company will only give you profits, your share of profits. But before it pays the interest, right? And interest you can see here is how much? 5%. Look, we decided that the interest is 5%. The interest is 5%. And debt is 100,000. 5% interest rate debt is 100,000. Unfortunately, I can't see the cursor moving. So that's why I'm... So what we do, before the company pays you, and who are you? You are only equity shareholder. The company must pay to the debt holders. How much? 5% on $100,000 borrowed money. This is the interest cost. So 5,000 is the interest cost or the finance cost. Out of 50,000 of total profits, the profit uh, minus the interest cost is 5,000. So whatever is left, over, left out is 45,000. This 45,000 belongs to the shareholders. And we assume there's no tax rate and we assume that all the money which is left over is given to the shareholders. <laughs> Since you own 10% of your shares, you take away 10% of the profits also. Okay. You carry home 4,500. You invested 10,000 in the company and you earned at the end of the year 45. 4,500. Your return on investment is 45%. Okay, this is situation one. Do you understand the mathematics now? Okay, now what happened? The company says, you know what? We will have no debt at all. We have chosen to become from a levered company to the unlevered company. So I come here. This is the initial situation, which I just showed you. The company says, hey, no, no more. We retire the debt. And we convert this debt to the equity. So one plus one, two, the company's value will still remain the same by modeling and that it doesn't matter. All right, but the thing is that it's not one and one, it's only two and zero. So one plus one is two, two plus zero is two. So nothing changes on surface. So the thing is that, so now the company become unlevered. So from 100,000 equity plus 100,000 debt, the company become fully equity company, which is 200,000. This is the company's decision. The point is that, is this decision going to affect you or not? Well, it will affect you. I'll show you why. 
how much did you earn when the company was levered? What percentage? For now keep 45. Remember this 45 percent. Are you still getting 45 percent or not? Now you still have company's investment ten thousand dollars. Do you? Earlier, you had a choice to invest in debt and equity, but you still chose to invest in equity. So you had an option, yeah? Now there's no option because the company has no debt. The company has become unlevered now. So the only way you can invest in the company is its equity. Remember, I'm, the company is no longer this now. The company is this now. So you have no option but invest in equity. How much you invest? Still saying ten thousand. How can your money change? Let's assume that you still have the same amount of money, ten thousand. Ten thousand is what percentage of uh, ten? 10,000 is what percentage of the company's total value, which is equity? 10,000 is what percentage of 200,000? Hmm? Isn't? Yeah, it is. 5%? So before the change, you are 10% owner of the company, of equity. Now you are 5% owner. Do you think that your interests are harmed in a way? Yeah. The company's operating profit, let's say that company's operating profit still remain 50,000. What is 5% of 50,000? 50,000 2,500. Well, all, they're done here. All the calculations <laughs> are done here. 5% of 50,000 is 2,500. You invest 10,000 and you get 2,500. Your rate of return is 25%. Whereas before this change, your rate of return was 45%. How can you say that you're not affected? You are affected. You are affected. Yeah. The question is that, should you be the silent spectator and let the company change its capital structure and affect you? No, you, you, you can be you can be a very shrewd and very, very smart investor, actually. You can say, you know what? I would contract. I would act opposite to what company has done so that my stakes are same. You have 10,000 of your own money, do you? You go to the bank and ask the bank, hey bank, I want to borrow 10,000 from you. Why 10,000? Because you want to keep your D to E ratio as before. So you're, you're now here, your own money has counted 10,000, yeah? yeah? And you also borrow from the bank 10,000. So what you do, 10,000 is your own money, which is the equity, but you also borrow 10,000 from the bank. How much you own now? 10%. So now you have 20,000 in the equity, right? So you invest 20,000 in the company's equity. When you own 20,000 of the company's equity, what percentage you own now? 10%? 10% of the profit, the, the total profit is $50,000, yeah? 10% of 50,000 is 5,000. 
Five thousand, yeah. But no, 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 no. It's not even more yet. Yeah. It's five. There's no tax. You had five thousand. Yeah. But don't you know that only ten thousand was your own money you borrowed from the bank? And now, now earlier the company was paying interest. The company converted itself to completely unlevered. The company will not pay any interest. But what you did, you borrowed from the bank. And you borrowed 10,000. 10,000 borrowing at 5%, 500. Right? Now you own 10% of the company. You have 10 percent of the profit which is 5000 happy but also pay 500 to the interest and 5000 minus 500 is 4500 4500 divide by your own investment which is 10000 your return on equity is still 45% so what happened the company made a change which affected you unfavorably. It could have affected you favorably also, but in this case, it affected you unfavorably. But you have done the counteraction so that even though the company's D to E ratio moved from one to zero, but your D to E ratio still remained one. 10,000 own money, 10,000 debt. And you are able to protect your financial uh stakes with the before the change you are getting 45 percent on equity return with the change your return came down to 20 percent was it 25 percent 25 percent yeah but then you made the change within your home homemade capital structure that you are able to earn once again 45 percent this is called homemade leverage. So when you study the concept of capital structure, not only the companies make changes in their, the companies where you invest in, not only they have the right to make changes in the capital structure, you can also bring changes in your own capital structure. Yeah? This is called homemade. Mm -hmm. Like some kind of moonshine, basically. Moonshine capital structure. Don't don't use this word. Yeah, it just yeah. Yeah. it's a nice word. Hmm? 